Hi, my name is Corey. I'm studying medical anthropology at Oxford. Um, and so I'd like to welcome you back to the final day of the 2013 Global Scholar Symposium. Uh, I've been given the honor of introducing Ms. Wanjira Mathai today. I had, the, I had the good fortune to meet Ms. Mathai while I was in Kenya last year, early last year, uh, when I was visiting the Greenbelt Movement's headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, it was an unfortunate time because it was shortly after uh, the death of uh, Wanjira's mother, uh, the late Nobel laureate, author, activist, and professor Wangari Mathai. Um, together with her mother, Wanjira has worked for years uh, to build the, global, the, the Green Belt movement into one of the most successful grassroots organizations in Kenya and in Africa. Uh, it's, a, it's a group that is empowering communities to, uh, to defend the environment, to stand up for their livelihoods, uh, and to fight for human rights. Uh, and so it is a distinct honor for me to, to welcome her here today. Uh, she's worked for, since 2002, as the Director of uh, International Affairs at the Green Belt Movement. Prior to that, she was a Senior Project Manager at uh, the, the, um, the, presidential center, the Carter Presidential Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she's spoken out against the U.S. role in stagnating talks at the U.S. Climate Forum, uh, the U.N. Climate Forum and she is currently the project leader for the Wangari Mathai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, which she's going to tell us more about. So please help me to welcome Ms. Wangari Mathai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Yeah, it's early. I thought my, I, I, I almost didn't make it myself. So I'm glad, I'm glad to see you all. Thank you for coming. Before I start, let me first thank the organizers of this or symposium for being so generous and hospitable. I must tell you, I'm traveling with my nine-month-old, and so it, it makes for interesting mornings when you have to be here early. But I especially want to thank Teresa Malikan, who's here, for being really a wonderful angel. Spent the whole day yesterday with Elsa, and Elsa came and passed out. So I think, you know, they had a good time. That's a fact. And Ian, who is actually watching her, right now as, you, as we speak. It's an honor to be here at Cambridge, really. I've never been here. It's such a beautiful place. It's a privilege, really, to be able to study in a place that is so rich in history and so rich in tradition. But also, as has been said so much in the last few days, that the, the sense of responsibility and the sense of a burden of what is expected of you is, is quite great. And I have to say, it reminds me a lot of the time that I spent working with my mother. I spent 12 years of the last 12 years of her life working with her every single day and watching as she <coughs> grappled with some of the responsibilities that came with having won the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, in 2004, she got a phone call on the 8th of October that she had won the Nobel Prize. For so many people, they thought she must have known in advance. Surely they called her and prepared her and set up a secretariat for her. But no, you get a call 30 minutes before the news goes to the world that you have won the Nobel Peace Prize. And so at 11.30, she got that phone call. And as was tradition, my mother was on her way out. She was a member of parliament, so she was traveling out to the countryside to meet with her constituents. She did this every Friday. She would travel on Friday and come back home on Monday. And so on Friday at about 11.30, she would stop at a particular place and have a cup of tea. It was really the last place before you got into you know, the place of no return. No phones, nothing worked. So it so happened that the call came when she was sitting at this place having a cup of tea. And when she took the call, she thought it was some sort of a joke first. And so she didn't believe it. So she said, OK, good. She hung up. And she had a plan. She was going to go on with her plan to, to see the community that was waiting to meet with her. But at exactly 12 o'clock, the news hit the wires around the world that Wangari Mathai has won the prize. Now, I didn't quite, and most of us probably don't appreciate how the Nobel Prize operates, but the committee announces this prize and they know you will be deluged. They've probably a few leakages, so journalists are all over the place knowing that it's one of two people. So journalists were in Kenya and they were in South Africa because they knew 
And that particular prize would go to a Kenyan or a South African, but they were not sure. Somehow they found out. So in less than 10 minutes, my mother was surrounded by international journalists from all over the world. <laughs> in that little town of Nyeri, she had no idea where they came from. And she was answering questions and looking at her watch and telling them that she had a place to go. She had an appointment she had to keep. But what was incredible was that even though we kept telling her that, mom, this is a big deal. <laughs> it was, she told me so many times, it's a big deal for the people who are waiting for me, so I must go. The president of Kenya called her and told her, you must come back and stand by me so that we can answer questions to the international press. And she said, I have an appointment with the people of Nyeri. I must go and see them, and then I will come. That was the kind of person she was, and that is the kind of person I feel we all want to be. That at that moment, when the spotlight is on us, what would be our decision? I can honestly tell you, I would be in that helicopter heading back to Nairobi <laughs> to get my time in the light. But I was always honestly amazed by that commitment that focus and that clarity that it was not about her, it was about those people. And yes, it was a big deal that she had won the Nobel Prize, but it was a big deal for the people who were waiting for her. And I always carried that with me because it was really about serving and for her, service was about the most satisfying thing. She always talked about how whatever you do in your life, Nothing will give you more satisfaction than serving others and giving to others. And that she did so consistently. In 1975, it was the international year of the woman. It was a year when the UN declared it would be a there would be a conference in Mexico City to recognize or to discuss the status of women. And so women all over the world, and I'm sure here in the UK, were gathering together to discuss what would be their issues when they go to Mexico City. In Kenya, this was happening, and women were gathering in Nairobi, much probably like this, where there was the delegation, and the women would just come in and share what they thought this delegation should present as Kenya's issues at the UN Conference for Women. My mother was one of those women. She, at that time, was representing the university women. She was the chair of the University Women's Council. And so she thought she had some serious issues that ought to be on the agenda. And as a young woman, academic member of staff at the University of Nairobi, she faced a lot of challenges. She was 35 years old, one of the youngest professors at the University of Nairobi. And at a time when there were only two women faculty members. And so the discrimination was incredible. She felt extremely offended that for the work she was doing, they were not getting equal pay. She felt extremely offended that she did not get the benefits that her male academic colleagues got. And so these were her issues, and she came with them, and she was to present them. But something happened at that gathering that made her put her issues in perspective. She listened to women from rural areas presenting their issues, what they thought ought to be the priorities in Mexico City. They talked about lack of clean drinking water. They talked about inability to find nutritious food for their children. They talked about lack of firewood, lack of healthy options. She was struck by just how basic those issues were and how really she had grown up in those circumstances and nothing was like what she was hearing. What had happened? She grew up in some of the same places that these women were talking about, and they were describing a reality she just could not imagine, that in the last 30 years or 20 years, everything had changed. She decided then that her issues were not going to be her priority, but that those women's issues would be the priority. And so much to the chagrin of the university women, her issues changed and became the issues that those women were presenting. She gathered with them and tried to understand more deeply what their issues were about and what had actually happened. And she realized that what was actually going on was the degradation of the land, that the land had been completely degraded and was unable to sustain them in the way it had. The rivers had dried up, the purity of the rivers had gone, and so with it had gone certain food crops that grew 
only in fresh water. She was also starting to realize that the green trees that she grew around, that her mother taught her about, had also disappeared. And so she knew that fundamentally something had changed. And she looked at the women and she said, why don't we plant trees? Why don't we plant trees and restore what we had? We live in a tropical country. Trees grow really fast. And luckily, she was a scientist. My mother was a scientist. Uh, she had a PhD in veterinary anatomy. So she, had not, she knew little about trees. But she knew how important they were. And she was able to make those connections and was able to then suge suggest to the women that if they formed groups and came together, she would do everything she could to work with them to ensure that they could plant trees and restore their land. So in 1977, she started the Greenbelt Movement. And the Greenbelt Movement was really about planting trees to restore the degraded lands. But as they planted trees over the years, and as she encouraged women to work together to grow seedlings and plant those trees, they started to appreciate that something more was going on beneath that, those trees. She saw that behind the everyday hardships that these women were going through were deeper issues, disempowerment, disenfranchisement, uh, political predatory leadership, economic misgovernance, inequality, and an erosion of values. In the past, all of these had actually cushioned these communities from the, the devastation that they were now facing. And that unless they worked together for the benefit of all as they had in the past, it was all going to end. So the hallmark of the Greenbelt Movement's work and the reason I'm actually excited to be here today was that it really took a lot of heavy lifting to work and try and understand the issues that were involved, but perhaps even more important, to help communities and work with communities to, for themselves to understand and appreciate that those, if those were their issues. So often, those of us who work in development, wherever we are in the world, we forget that our issues may not be their issues. Our issues may not be their priority. And that it takes putting your perceptions and your, your, your toolbox aside and listening. And we call that the heavy lifting. And we started a bunch of seminars called this Community Education and Empowerment that were a journey to explore what the issues were, even when we thought we knew them. So the community empowerment and education seminars encouraged individuals to analyze the challenges they faced. It was a three day, literally took three days to work with a small group of people to explore what might be the two, three priority issues they needed to work on. So it took one day to analyze the issues and just list, and we would put them up on the wall, like hundreds of issues would come up. And then the second day was about where do we think these issues come from? And the third day was about what are we going to do about them? And inevitably, when you looked at those issues and started to cluster them, it was clear that some of those issues were things they could deal with themselves. It didn't need somebody else to come and deal with them. Some of those issues were about getting more involved in civic issues in the local community and even putting themselves forward for leadership, for better leadership, because they were looking for better leaders when they themselves may be the leaders they were looking for. And so it was really about helping people erase those boundaries and have the flexibility to feel that they themselves were in charge of their destiny. Now you're talking about a situation we were working with, and we still do, largely illiterate women. And so communicating this, what I'm saying to you today, is done in a very different way. It's done in pictures. It's done in songs. One of my mother's favorite songs, when she wanted to take some points home, she would, especially because Kenya, you have to understand that Kenya is a very religious country. 80% of Kenya are professed Christians. So singing Christian songs rings, and especially in the rural areas. And so sometimes in these seminars, we break into song. And one of the songs 
that we sing is this world is not my home. And the profound words in that song that if indeed this world is not your home, then where is your home? And if this world is not your home, then obviously you wouldn't take care of it. It's not your home. And you're passing by apparently, so you're headed somewhere. Where is that? And so we start to unpack the songs that actually give so much meaning to these people's lives. And through, those, through that process, an awakening happens. It's an absolutely magical process where on the third day, without exception, and we've been doing this for the last 40 years, something clicks. And at that point, you know it will be a sustained, consistent, committed process to change their own communities. Now, the Greenbelt Movement and these seminars are always focused around four particular, core, what we call core values. Love for the environment. In your own homes, we, we have these discussions. In your own homes, what does your environment look like? We're telling you to protect the environment outside your home, but how about at home? Do you plant trees? Do you nurture them? Do you have flowers? Trying to nurture a sense of love for the environment. Gratitude and respect for the Earth's resources. What do you waste? Do you reuse? Do you reduce? Do you recycle? Do you compost, especially in the rural areas? We try and encourage people to reuse a lot of what they have. And by demonstrating just how much valuable resource goes into the trash. Self-empowerment and self-betterment, or the power to change, that this whole process that I talked about for the three days is about a journey that you actually are the one who can change your own destiny and the spirit of service and volunteerism, which is really the hallmark of the Greenbelt Movement, that one has got to have that ability to selflessly work for the common good. These are universal values without which the Greenbelt Movement really would not exist, would not have survived. And one of the things that is incredible is that it takes time. That's another thing that I wanted to share with you here. The Greenbelt Movement's work of transforming communities has taken a lot of time. I was talking to somebody yesterday about the work that we do to protect green spaces in Nairobi. One of the big parks, much like Hyde Park is to London, was threatened in the early 90s. It took the Greenbelt Movement 15 years to secure that park. Do we have that kind of commitment, persistence to keep going, and patience? That's what it takes, and an amazing moment in these seminars is when participants begin to make those connections. That it's, we are here for the long term, it's us who have to make the difference. And then they start to understand their roles and their responsibilities. But they also start to understand their own impediments. What do they do that makes it difficult for them to achieve what they would like? And so they also start to change their behavior, adopt new values, and start to reflect what they would like to see beyond their borders. One of the things that the Greenbelt Movement does, and that is probably why the Nobel Prize was awarded, for many people, when Wangari Mathai got the Nobel Peace Prize, they said, she got the Nobel Peace Prize for planting trees. Are you kidding? But it really wasn't about planting trees. It was about planting trees, yes, but it was also about planting seeds of a different sort. The sorts of trees of peace and reconciliation. Because while we gathered people together to talk about the environment, we also talked about civic leadership, we talked about the democracy, democratic space, and also about the trauma. For many people in rural areas, there's a lot of trauma that has to do with the historical injustices around land. Those of you who understand Kenya's history, will know that there's a lot of trauma underneath. And all of that was manifesting itself. And so the seeds needed, the, the work needed to acknowledge that, acknowledge that trauma, and work on a process of deep-seated healing, and um, get, get back the dignity and self-confidence that they had lost. After 30 years of work in this area, and now 40, we realized that even though we were making a difference at the Greenbelt Movement, that change was not happening fast enough, and it was not reaching enough people. 
a lot of the practitioners we were working with, a lot of the people we hired, didn't themselves quite understand the linkages between the environment, democracy, and peace. And that we wanted to see if we can take a step back and get the training for the practitioners we were working with to reflect the work that we were going to do with the Green Belt Movement. And so we started the hard work of establishing a relationship, an unprecedented relationship with the University of Nairobi to set up an institute that would focus on experiential learning, that would focus on training practitioners, community members, and anybody really about how to do and not just knowledge. How do you actually practically speak to a community? How do you mobilize? How do you raise awareness? How do you empower? What does it all mean? Can we actually go and see it happening? And so we have established a PhD and master's program at the University of Nairobi that is really based on practice, especially around the issues of forestry and conflict with the issues of climate change and what we know about the encroachment of forests by agriculture especially. But our students are spending their time in the forest more than they're spending their time in the classroom. And we know that although most institutions of learning impart on students a lot of knowledge, a lot of it is unutilized. They get out and they don't use it. And we're saying we need to work the other way around. Can we bring the knowledge we have from the field into the classroom? and have them learn practical skills and tools and equip them with what they need to do to actually make that transformation happen faster and broader. So enriching the capacity of these knowledge holders by providing opportunities for, for experiential learning was an opportunity we could not pass up. So the Wangai Mathai Institute is now established at the University of Nairobi, offering a PhD and master's program. But also for me, what's most exciting is it's offering what we call an international certificate program that opens the doors of the institution to non-academic participants, people who are farmers who want to come and get better at farming practices. Lawyers who want to understand the environmental law and their responsibility in protecting the commons. Who want to understand the role they play in the courts so that they ensure that the environment is green and safe. In Kenya today, we have a constitution that, is, that enshrines in it environmental rights. And so it behooves a lot of the legal fraternity to understand that and to be part of uh, making the difference. So working with some of the leading lights in Sweden and also in Kenya and South Africa, we have established an international certificate program around environmental governance and peace, sustainable land use, resource management, waste management, and ethical uh, environmental education and values. The institute is focused on the necessity to provide university graduates with a practical understanding of the realities of ordinary farmers something most of them only have a theoretical awareness of. To bridge this skills and knowledge gap, we conceived the institute and now a place where academics can better connect with communities during their course of study. Unless we do this, unless we change the way we learn and connect, when we leave, that's when the learning begins. So we think we've learned, and then we graduate, and then we start learning again. And so unless we change that, the, the real transformation that we're trying to achieve will be a distant dream. Yesterday, when Richard Rees, um, no, Lord Martin Rees, invited us to imagine aliens looking at the planet, looking at us on, this, uh, on Earth from outer space, I thought he must have snuck my speech <laughs> and read it. Because one of the most profound things was that in 2005, Eileen Collins, not alien, Eileen Collins was the first woman commander, the first woman to command a shuttle exploration. And as she brought the shuttle back from space, she looked over and she saw the planet. She happened to fly they happened to see Africa as she was coming down. And Eileen reported seeing massive 
fires and smoke over Central Africa. She reported seeing massive deforestation over Madagascar. And it was extremely profound because for her, what was more dramatic for me is what she said. Why do they do these things? If she had asked me that question, I don't know what I would have said because really what she saw was unacceptable. Why are you doing these things? But I want to share with you the fact that these are global issues. It's not an African issue. It's a global issue and then issues that it will be up to us to resolve. In 2007, I traveled, in closing, I want to share that in 2007, I traveled with my mother to Cameroon. And this was so typical of her because she was so observant everywhere she went. And she was, at that time, had been appointed the Goodwill Ambassador for the Congo Basin Forest. And that meant that she was to raise awareness about this massive lung of the earth around the world. And during that visit to Cameroon, she was attending one of the sessions with the heads of state from the African region. And they were discussing the forest, how to protect it, and these very important issues. But at that reception, as she waited for the transportation to take her to the meeting, she happened to glance across at the hill that was right across the hotel. And when she looked over, she noticed a woman farming and tilling along the gradient of the hill. And that woman was very busy from very early in the morning, working her terraces, exactly the opposite of what she should have been doing. And my mother, in her exasperation, turned around and asked people around her, why do you think that woman is doing that? Many of them answered, well, I, I didn't even see she was there. Oh, wow. I don't know why she's doing that. Maybe she doesn't want the water to interfere with her crops. And so the responses came, none of which was the right one. And so she felt a compulsion not to even attend the meeting she was attending. Because she said to me, unless we can first see that woman on the hillside and reach her, it doesn't matter how much talking we do. That's what it's about. It's the same thing for all of you, unless you can see the proverbial women on the hillside, and unless you can reach them, your efforts will really be for naught. So I really encourage you to sharpen your skill to see and to sharpen your skill to reach. In whatever you do, that's what we do every day. And that's what we're doing at the Wangari Mathai Institute. Because we know that wherever we are around the world, seeing and reaching those women on the hillside will be the great work of our time. Thank you. Um, do we want to take some questions now? Does anyone have a, a question to start? Hi, uh, my name is Hailiki. I'm doing a PhD in Gender Studies here at Cambridge. Thank you so much for your talk. I think you've uh, really you've uh, you have an achievement by keeping us so awake um, <laughs> this early on the Sunday. Um, I was really um, really struck by uh, you know the way you work so closely with communities, and I'm quite interested in um, how we might um, kind of close the gap between what is done at the kind of international level with UN programs, for example, and you know the kind of work that you do, which is well, at least seems so much more engaged with the community. So I was wondering if you could comment on, perhaps in relation to UN programs in Kenya, how we might transform the way that um, United Nations programs work with country offices, for example, to kind of close that gap between lots of talk at, at the international level and what the people actually need and want. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's a constant struggle, right? This is, that is the biggest challenge we have. 
I live in Nairobi, and Nairobi is the home of the United Nations Environment Program. This is the UN's arm on environment. But they themselves internally struggle with their identity. Are they implementers, or are they just policy talk shops? And so I know for the UN, it's a big, big challenge. For us, who are actually practitioners, we've always been saying that it's critically important for UN organizations, a lot of international research organizations, to actually work with people who have experience on the ground. It's critical to partner with people who have their feet on the ground, their hands in the soil. Because unless you do that, it's difficult to, to decide how effective your policies are, how, what are you talking about? And the other way is true. A lot of the people who are doing the hard work with their heads in the soil hardly get to the fora to share their experiences and their approach. And so that gap needs to be closed. It's happening. I have to say that we see a lot more uh, farmers at, at big conferences telling about their experiences with certain farming practices and certain um, agricultural uh, suggestions that are being made about how to, to, to do agriculture, and, and especially seed, seed, for, seed banks. But unless we bring that, those two communities closer, it's going to be a proverbial ch challenge. But it's not happening fast enough. And it's not, certainly not happening from the UN. It almost, be, it almost is like they feel, if we are implementers, we lose that moral authority, moral voice, and yet, Unless that moral authority and moral voice is informed by practical examples from the field, it's a bit hollow. And so we work on that every single day in Kenya, so I know it's a big challenge. Thank you so much for being here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Alex, and I study math here at Cambridge. Um, but I oftentimes, I think, think of myself more as a musician. And I really love um, this idea you were saying about using song to um, reach out to the people. And also, this beautiful image of looking at Africa from space and yeah. seeing directly what we're dealing with. Um, and so my question is, how do you go from this broad, beautiful language of talking about what we're working with to actually sitting down with the woman on the hill and saying, look, here are the mechanics of why, in fact, you should tear us this way instead of that way. And how do you move to actually the, the, dis, the maybe technical discussion of the real mechanics of what needs to change? Okay. Thank you for that question, Alex. Um, that's the, the importance of that part, the music, and getting the message across is to open their minds to the possibility that are different ways possible. Because a lot of people who do things the way they do it, it's, it's a habit. So they wake up in the morning and they let the animals out into the forest. They've done that for a long time. And until you can give something that makes a, fun a, a fundamental shift in the way they understand what they're doing, it will not change. But yes, we must get down to the technical side of so what do we do and how do we do it? So the Greenbelt Movement partners with a lot of organizations who have best practice in various areas, especially because we are experts in tree planting. We're not very good at organic farming. But sometimes in the process of these explorations, the, the agricultural side raises to the top. Tree planting is not always the priority. So we have to pull in experts from all different sectors to come and demonstrate on farm how it needs to be done. And it's always part of the training. It's not a side of the training. You basically have to, when the issues are established, we leave and we come back to follow up what the issues, what issues were raised and what needs to be demonstrated for people to understand what needs to be done. So it's a, it's a you know, one of the things we say in the Greenbelt Movement is, it's almost like you start a, ro a rock rolling down the hill, a stone is rolling down the hill, and once it starts, it doesn't stop. Our engagement with communities is long-term, it changes, it morphs from tree planting to livelihoods to sometimes just visiting, but that relationship is ongoing and continuous. So. <coughs> Uh, thanks as well for your talk. I'm Alice, and I'm studying epidemiology and public health at Imperial College London. 
And I was wondering, you, you talked about how these processes take a long time and it takes a lot of time to understand what a community needs and how you can partner and help. And many of us have you know, one to three years left in our degrees, which is not a particularly long time. So I was wondering how you think in that very short amount of time we can make the best effort to learn how to see and communicate and prepare ourselves to make a bigger impact later than the small, very small impact that we can perhaps make now. Yeah. You know, I, maybe I'm not a very, um, it may not be a popular position, but one of the things that I absolutely feel is critical is that it, at one point in your educational journey, you have to visit a place that you've never been before. How many of you have been outside into Asia, into the local communities, and really experience it? There is nothing that would prepare you better than being in a place and seeing and smelling and, and understanding what's going on. So make it a commitment to go somewhere and immerse yourself. That's one, one way in a short period of time. But I think also working with groups, there are a lot of people doing great work, and so working with people who are involved in the area of study that you're involved in. I studied public health, so I know there are a lot of people doing incredible work. And it's so difficult to appreciate public health until you're in the situation. Until I went to northern Uganda and saw cracks in the ground as wide as this place, I didn't quite understand drought. You know, we say drought and famine and floods. I mean, it's all nice and easy, but when you actually see it, it's devastation that you cannot imagine on pieces of paper. So I would urge you to try and find a way to make part of your training out there so that you can start to link what you're studying, your knowledge, with what's actually happening on the ground. And I can't imagine that doesn't happen. In, in a place like this, or in, in some of the colleges where you, you're coming from. So that's my number one. It made a big difference for me, and I know it will. It's a, it's a lasting impact. Next question over Hi, um, my name is Jacqueline, and I'm studying plant sciences here at the University of Cambridge. Um, I want to thank you for your talk. It was very motivational, very, very inspirational. And I know you talked about, or at least I presume that everyone here who's attending the symposium, we would like to make an impact. We do want to improve the lives of others. And there are all these global goals that we want to achieve. But my, and, but my question to you is that there must be so many opposing voices, so many obstacles that we have to go through. And how do we know that the methods that we are employing are the right ones? How do we persevere? Like, let's say if, you, if it needs 15, 30 years for us to actually reach our global goals, if not more, if not, we might not even see it within our lifetime. How do we know that, not, not that the global goals are wrong, but how do we ensure that the methods we are employing are the right ones? Ah, thanks, yeah. Jacqueline. Thank you. I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I mean, we all are trying, right? We, at the Greenbelt Movement, we call it, if it didn't work today, don't do it tomorrow. Because you just, nobody has all the answers. So you have to just keep chipping at it. For me, the most important thing is that whatever you do, you must commit to it for the long term. Focus on it for the long term. And in the process, Things will come together. Yes, you'll make mistakes. But then, with time, you'll start to get it right. But as long as you're not hopping around, at least for us, it has been the case. We have stuck with what we are doing for the last 40 years, and we're still fixing it. So it takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. So don't feel like you have to know. There is no prescription, and the time, our times are changing. Today we are talking in Nairobi, I'll, I'll give you a very good example, that we're having the rainy season. The rainy season in Kenya is a nightmare because the rains come and people are drowning. This is, it's one of the most difficult times when in fact we should be celebrating the rains have come. This year we have had unprecedented floods and landslides in a way 
We've never dealt with landslides in the way we are dealing with landslides now. I'm talking about you wake up in the night and the house has been is down the hill. So we are dealing with issues today that we didn't even deal with last year. So we have to, again, change and adapt our, some of our training to start to understand what's going on today. So it's going to be a difficult journey, but if you commit to it, you'll respond to the issues as they come. You'll respond to the issues from your own experiences. And as you build it, that accumulated experience really is the best source, isn't it? So I would encourage you not to know the answers. Just go for it. Hi, thank you for your talk. My name is Tomislav, I come from Croatia, and I study environment, society, and development here in Cambridge. But I was also a, a Tunza advisor mm -hmm. to the United Nations Environment Program. So I was, I've been many times in Gigiri, and I kind of see, seen also the UNEP from the inside. I didn't like many things that I saw, and, uh, and I was also quite active on international policy level for 10 years. I looked one sum, summit after another, being wasted and a lot of the progress in climate change negotiations not happening. The last, last year, Rio Plus 20 conference, where there were many expectations and not many uh, delivering being done. And how do you see this kind of glow? I mean, I, I went back to community level work because I could feel that I can do much more impact on that level. But also, I mean, just doing the, the global, the, just doing the local work will not be enough. I mean, without the changing of the, the structures on a global level, the policies, how do you see? I mean, what's? Wh how do you see the trends on a global level? I mean, how do you also recon How do we rec reconcile this local and global level? I mean, and kind of uh, a closed gap. Yeah. I, I hear you. I mean, the the challenge for all of us is to make sure that our issues end up on the priority list. Because we need those international organizations. So they convene government. The ministers of environment from all over the world convene are members of the governing council of UNEP. So we have to work with the United Nations Environment Program. And United Nations, nobody has better convening power than the United Nations bodies. They can bring people together. And even in Kenya, in small ways, we, in, we use the United Nations to convene. What we must do as grassroots organization is continue to be present at the table. We have to continue to participate. We have to continue to bring our experience in and not be shy about it. So often we go and because the minister is there, we don't want to say anything. But we continue to allow them to use old ideas, yet you know you're working on those issues now. So we push a lot at the Greenbelt Movement to be present at every single place that we can be and to shout what we're doing, what we, are, what we are seeing, what we are finding. And before you know it, for, it finds its way in. And we need that because that is where the decisions are being made at the end of the day. We have always worked very closely with government. Even when we've challenged them, we know that we cannot succeed in the work that we do unless the government is involved. So I say get to the table, put your issues there. And the more of us there are, it starts to become their reality too. And we see that actually in the environment discussion. It's not by mistake that Kenya today has a constitution that enshrines environmental rights. Just 10 years ago, you could not, if you went to the courts and said that the park around the corner is someone wants to put up an apartment block, the court couldn't do anything. They'd say that's not your land, it's environment, it's the commons, and the commons do, doesn't have a voice. So, but today in the Constitution, because of organizations like the Greenbelt Movement, that doesn't happen anymore. So we can make a difference. We just have to be present. Hi, I'm Tenzin, and I'm studying social policy. Um, one of the key addresses given um, during this session was by the Dalai Lama, and he talked about using nonviolence for a conflict resolution. And I know that watching a documentary about your mother, she also did a lot of sit-ins and hunger strikes as a way to advance the rights of uh, the Kenyan women and people. So I'm wondering first is, how was she influenced by nonviolence? And um, how does civil disobedience play into the part of um, the Green Belt movement? And who are the people that have shaped her and you? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, 
My mother was deeply inspired by Gandhi. She was really moved by, one, his simplicity, yet at the same time, his sophistication. He had such a good understanding. And when you understand the other side so well, you can come and simplify it and actually, in many ways, put, a, put wool over their eyes and, and pass. My mother was very good at advocacy at the highest level, but also at the grassroots level. Civil disobedience was very much a part of the strategy that she employed, but one of the things that was constant was she never broke the law. She never, ever broke the law. What she did was make everything very public, always into open letters to the media, and then mass, mass engagement. So involving the general public in all the issues that she did was one of the hallmarks of the campaigns that were very successful. The University of Nairobi is a very politicized institution. The students get involved. So getting the word out to anybody and everybody was critical to some of the issues that you saw in that documentary. Saving the parks, having the hunger strikes with the mothers of political prisoners, and making sure that you stick with it. This was the particular campaign where the women slept outside in Uhuru Park for almost a year, waiting. They said they would not go home until their sons were released. And they stayed there, and members of the public came and protected them, gave them food, gave them drinks. Some of them were really old, but they stuck with it for one year. How many of us would do that? So anyway, it's just really that commitment and that clarity. And we saw that yesterday with His Holiness. I mean, he, that's, that's an, you, know, you know, you're not shaking or shaken by anything on the side. It's just such a singular focus on what you need to do. So for her, that, that was the way she lived her life. And it was, if it was not that issue, it was the next issue that resonated, that the commons especially were out of bounds for developers and, and people who are trying to grab what we call grab land. So that's, you know, and I would say Gandhi to the most, for most of what she did was a, was a great inspiration. Mother Teresa too. My mother was raised heavily Catholic. And so she had a very deep sense of wonder about nuns. She always said, how could these beautiful women give their lives for, the, for everything they did was for that singular commitment to service of others. She was deeply moved by that. And so it inspired a lot of what she did, if she could even do a little bit. She used to say, it's the nun in me. <laughs> Someone? Uh, thank you very much for that. My name's Nat. I do social entrepreneurship and international development at Oxford. Uh, one of the things that I liked about your talk was your, I think you said a line, uh, we need to put our toolboxes down and start listening to people. And it's, I think that was similar to what Muhammad Yunus said when he said we need to match a bird's eye view with a worm's eye view. Mm. But on the other hand, I think there's a, there's a good argument that often people on the ground don't always, or their responses about what they need is limited by their experiences. I think it was Henry Ford who said, uh, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. I think in Kenya, people wouldn't have said mobile banking as something they wanted or needed or would benefit from. Uh, and so I know the two aren't mutually exclusive, but where, how do you strike the balance between asking people what they need and responding to it, or actually thinking that new innovative ways of doing things might actually serve them in a better way? And that's a good question, and you're right. <laughs> Mobile banking was not in anybody's, anybody's reality. My, my personal opinion, and it's not informed by, by anything, is that we really still, as a matter of priority, have to help people cross the blockages that they have. So it doesn't matter what you think they need, and yes, we have to strike the balance. Unless you meet them where they are and at the point of their need, it's unlikely that they'll respond anyway to what you bring them. So you might think they need mobile banking. But as long as water and food are the basic fundamental things that are missing, and you don't address those first, you're still going to have an issue, a difficulty getting across. 
that's one. I think we still need to meet the communities at the point of their need to even facilitate our own agendas, whatever those might be. I also think that it's critical for people who have those skills. For example, Safaricom, who developed the mobile banking and, and um, has transformed, really, the way Kenyans communicate and, and bank, especially at the rural areas, need to get involved themselves at that technical level with the grassroots. So it's not as if they have to down necessarily their tools and come and work in a different way, but they need to come and listen with those, that technical hat on and listen to those same women, because they too will be inspired. M-Pesa was inspired not by a very high technologically, uh, some engineers at the high level, it was actually somebody else who came up with the, the real genius behind M-Pesa. So I think that it is, they are not mutually exclusive, but you still have to, those of us who are trying to make that transformation happen, have to come down to the local level and listen, and try and get people, until they actually believe what you're saying, it's not gonna happen. So it's tough, it takes time, but it's still the only way that actually is sustainable. We have time for maybe, maybe one or two more questions, so. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Many thanks, Wanjira. Uh, I'm Gregory Akal from Kenya. I'm reading geography at uh, University of Cambridge. I'd just like to ask you a question. How does the Green Belt Movement protect the rights of uh, forest-dependent communities, given that uh, your late mother was not really an advocate of the Shamba system, where most of the communities relying on the forest were doing a bit of farming. So how do you kind of uh, do not compromise the rights of those people, right to food, right to health, and right to, to water for those communities, mm -hmm. at the same time protecting the green spaces? Thank you for that question. No, you're right. And for those of you who may not know that the, <clears throat> the gentleman made reference to the Shamba system, which is a, a form of farming in Kenya where the, the Kenya Forest Service uses local labor to reforest degraded areas. And in return, the local community is allowed to farm in that forest area as they nurture the seedlings that they've planted. It would be wonderful if they, it actually worked. And so he makes reference to the fact that we are opposed to it, and we are. One of the things that we have found is that when you allow communities to farm in the forest, they have no incentive to move on three years down the road. Why would they? This is great. I will continue to farm here until the seedlings are old enough to survive on their own. I just have to make sure that these seedlings don't survive. And then I'll be here for another three years. And so what has happened, the tragedy of the Kenyan forestry system, is that we have a deficit of 30 years when trees that should have been planted should have been mature now. And then we found out, we woke up to the fact that they were never planted at all. And so the Shamba system to us is, has been misused in and of itself. It's not a bad idea if it worked, but it doesn't. And so the Greenbelt movement has been quite vocal about saying we need to understand that Kenya has only less than 2% forest cover. We need 10% minimum for sustainable development to happen, for floods to not drown us. And so we ought to make a decision as a country whether we are going to farm in the forest or protect the forest. And unfortunately, the parts of the forest that are being used for this, what we call non-resident cultivation, are the parts in the forest that we should be conserving. And so we continue to hammer on, and I think the, the new government has made the environment a priority, so they will find us at the doorstep. But I think it's so important for Kenyans to understand that it is not about the Green Belt Movement or anybody. It's about themselves. And if you actually take time to go and find out 
forests that should have been reforested by that process and have not. You'll find cabbages and potatoes and very happy farmers. So I don't blame them, but I think we ought to be helping the situation. One of the things, um, I think you also mentioned the, non, the, the resident, the forest dwellers. That's also a very big challenge. I mean, the Kenyans in the room know when we say, it's very Kenyan of us to do this. Because a lot of the forest dwellers themselves have lived in harmony in the forest for so many years. They have, they, the, the forest is not being destroyed by forest dwellers, we know that. Unfortunately, there are new forest dwellers emerging who migrate into the forest for not the right reasons and again cause more destruction in those forests. And so to, in an effort to try and manage that situation, who are the real ogiek and who are the fake ones who have just come to burn charcoal, quite frankly. So we have a big challenge in Kenya to, to have some values so that the Oge can continue to live in the forest in the way they have for millennia. And we can continue to have forests because they have always lived in harmony. It's the new ones, the Wanjiras of this world, who have marched in and have made life difficult for the Oge. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to unravel that when it's active. So for Kenya, most of the time, the decision is to close things out, everybody out, while we sort this problem. And so that's the challenge. It's not ideal, but I think it's important. And uh, I, think, I think we're out of time. We have to move on to the next session soon. So can you join me in thanking Wanjiro? Yeah, yeah.